Hi guys, Ted Elsner, Sacramento Historical Fencing Academy. So, today we are there. We are at the end of the rules of the row stock. The very last part, after Meyer's gone through and given us, you know, his various sets of rules, both the four plus one of the standard row stock and then the five rules of the diagram, he finishes off with a poem. At the very end, he gives us just kind of a few couplets to really bring it all together. And that's what we're going to be looking at today in this video. So before we get started, as always, guys, if you can do me a favor, hit, hit that like button, maybe subscribe to us if you haven't already, follow us on Facebook, uh, leave a comment, tell us what you think. We appreciate it. Absolutely. But anyway, let's take a look at this final bit of the rules of the Rostock. The poem of the Rostock. In the weak, you can control him. In the strong, you want to crowd in. Between the two, parry well, and work diligently in all engagements. The before and after bring awe. In all engagements, take heed of the slice. In Zuken, Rukin, apply the beat. When remaining, Nachreisen, find the opening. Seize the before and after, you hold it well. Bring yourself out well, he must let you go. All right, guys, so as always, with our translations, um, there are a couple of notes for this particular one. If you go and look for the original material, you'll find a few different areas where people translate this a little bit differently. Notably, um, where I've translated it as uh, the before and after bring awe. The term used in this is the one that we find uh, actually in the earlier RDL tradition as well, where... Uh, the term wonder and wounder are kind of a double meaning. We decided to go with awe just to, to bring a greater sense of the two together and not get focused on one or the other because both apply. So use neither of them to bring attention to both of them. The second part uh, that needs to be noted is where we've translated the term stos or stos uh, as beat. Now, you'll see other translations of this occur, sometimes with a push, sometimes as a thrust, but based on our readings and our understandings of it, um, we came to the conclusion that the beat was the best term to be used in this situation. So that's what we're going to look at as we jump over and take these uh, sets of rules together kind of one by one. All right, so the first part we want to look at is the beginning of the poem, where in the weak, you can control him, in the strong, you want to crowd in, between the two, Carry well. So that first part where we're looking at controlling in the week, this is kind of counterintuitive. I can't control Jeff. He's over there. How do I actually do anything to him? Well, my actions will dictate responses from him. So for instance, I might approach with my sword out here in Long Point. Now, very likely Jeff may decide to meet me in Long Point as well, in which case I'm going to want to fall back to the previous set of rules. And in the beginning, I'm going to establish my overbind using the short edge and wind on. If Jeff does nothing, now I'm going to wind over and I can continue my press up into the outer circle, giving me my attack straight in behind at him in time. Okay? So I've just controlled him there. I came forward with my point in line. He brought his sword forward to defend against it, and that gave me an opportunity to create my overbind and then attack. Okay, well, we can look at him as a smart fencer. He knows he does not want to allow me to gain an overbind. So I come forward again with my point forward, and Jeff comes up to meet me. And as I go, he switches over. So now I'm going to wind back, pressing and controlling his sword, press to that outer circle, point up, thrust into the other side as well. My initial action has given predictable responses. If we're out here in the week and he comes forward with his point and I start to engage, if he does a disengage underneath the blade, then I'll simply shift back with the long edge. Now, in between these two spaces, I need to parry well. I need to be on my guard because if Jeff decides to leave the bind at this distance, which he can very safely, I need to come back and parry against it, right? That space in between the two is his opportunity to work indes against me. If I just don't pay attention to that and I don't parry well, and I just say, oh, I'm going to push and push and push, and I don't pay attention to his attack as it comes back around on me, and it's going to come in from above, right? I'm going to get hit. Now, there is a third option that um, we should expect as well. If I come forward with the point, he might decide to withdraw. Okay, if he withdraws, right, now we'll kind of shoot down with a shield how to gain that blade and thrust in in time as well. 
depending on how soon he goes to that, we might be able to really get that shield how into effect where he comes in and sees that it's there. And as I start to cross in, right, strike and, and hit down through it. It's going to play out a number of different ways, guys. I don't want to spend the entire video on this part. We will come back to it in a future video and really look at all the implications of this particular section. All right, so that leads us to the next part. And work diligently in all engagements. The before and after bring awe. And in all engagements, take heed of the slice. So I noted that we needed to look at the term that we were using, awe, instead of wonder or wounder. Mostly we did that, as I said, to kind of um, separate out the confusion. But it is important to understand something here. Every attack we want to make, every time we're going to wound our opponent or make them, you know, look at us in awe, has to happen either in the vor or the knock. Even if I'm working in des, I'm still either working in des in the vor or in des in the knock. If I try and attack and deliver a wound to Jeff outside of that, that means that we're operating what Meyer refers to as Gleich simultaneously, and that's where doubles come from. That's where we're both going to get injured for this. So however I get there, if I attack at Jeff, right, and as he goes to start to push me off to the side and parry, right, okay, I can get a wounder to occur at that point because I'm now working within his motion. On the other hand, if I just come in, bam, and I don't even think about it, and I just cut around at him, maybe I've given it to him, and now he gets to work in the knock to engage against me. Or we're both really, really silly, hanging out in flug, and we decide to just stab at each other's left quadrant without caring about it, and we stab each other and die, because neither of us was in the vor, neither of us was in the knock, we were working simultaneously, we didn't pay attention to the need to defend ourselves, we gave up all the rules, and we die. It's no good. The other part, um, in all engagements, take heed of the slice. Meyer's telling us again, if, if I get pushed back, if something happens and I don't know what else to do, put the slice on your opponent. Maybe Jeff is attacking me and he throws a cut and I parry, bam, and he, and he strikes around again. And I oh, parry again. Yeah, go ahead. Bam. And he strikes around one more time. I'm just going to put the slice on. I don't know. I'll put the slice on. I can always interrupt him by putting my sword on him. Now, is this going to kill him? No, absolutely not. He might, you know, push back. But still, it's giving me something to control him. So always remember the slice is there. We're told this repeatedly that we have the slice, we should use it. Practice it more. All right, next. In Zuken, Rukin, apply the beat. When remaining, Nakreisen, find the opening. So that first part, um, Zuken and Rukin go hand in hand. Now, we mentioned in the earlier rule on the Rukhauen uh, that it is a, it is a short edge strike as a beat. And this is largely where we pull this interpretation and this idea from. But it also comes by looking at some of the ways that Meyer uses Zuckin in the 1570 to further understand it. So, for instance, here is how we interpret Meyer's initial showing of the 1570s Zuckin. I strike in at Jeff, and I'm going to gain an overbind, but I'm on his strong. So any attempt to push straight in is going to result in failure on my part because he can very easily strengthen himself. So instead, I will start to pull back towards Ox, which may result in him trying to chase in at me or even go for a changing through underneath of my sword as I create that opening. I'm then going to strike back to the same opening with the short edge. Now, depending on the timing for it, I may find myself coming back in on the same side of the blade, but if he goes through for that changing through, right there. And I'm coming back to the same opening with the short edge that I had right before. That was a Zuken pulling back, followed by a Rukin jerking and striking forward. Uh, not as an Ausnehmen, but as a strike. A similar thing can happen in this kind of overbind situation if I start to pull back to Flug to draw a thrust in, then thrusting the point back in. So I pull back, he chases through, then I shoot the point, turn it, and stab him in the face. So it's important during this combination of the two that Zuken and Rukin go hand in hand. Now that's not to say there aren't other places that we can do Rukin by themselves, but if you're doing Zuken, it should immediately be followed by Rukin. 
which is why then we say apply the beat, right? It might be a thrust, it might be a, a cut, but there's definitely going to be a beat that occurs on our opponent's blade if we do it properly. The next part in remaining, bleiben, that moment as we reach, we need to see if our opponent decides to act as we strike into that bind. Maybe they're immediately going. And whenever we have that happen, we're given an opportunity for our knock rising. So as I strike in, if Jeff then starts to do something, right? Bam, strike around. Why did I follow that strike? Well, back to our previous sets of rules. He's gonna push me up out of the uh, bind, right? I'm in the outer circle, he's getting it. So we know that then we wanna follow the nearest line back through to strike underneath. Why am I striking around like that? Well, he's on the middle of my sword. So I wanna strike up with the uh, uh, Ablaufen in this point. On the other hand, you know, if he's on, if he's on my weak as it goes through, okay, right? We can strike in and push up through. We can do it as a short edge strike where he, where he comes in. Oh, okay. I'm the one that should change through on that. Right, so he presses over, I'll change through, pop, wind it up, drive it in, numerous options. Uh, if he ends up on my strong, then I'm going to wrench. But the key there is remain for a moment, see what the opponent does, and then chase the opening, leaving where, or seeing where they left, attacking back into it. So if he's going from a lower opening to an upper opening out of the strike as it comes in, right, that's the line I want to follow and it'll set me on the correct path to both defend myself and engage him safely. All right, so finally we get to the last of the couplets. Seize the before and after, you hold it well. Bring yourself out well, he must let you go. So for this part, um, seize the before or seize the vor is something that uh, in the German school of things, we've heard countless times, more than I even want to imagine. But important during this is Meyer also is telling you to seize the after. Don't shame it, right? If we get into that situation, we're always trying to be the first person to attack, while, yeah, sometimes useful, a savvy opponent is going to take advantage of that, okay? So don't be afraid to be forced into it and then take the after. Take your strong uh, parry position and drive with it. Follow the previous sets of rules. Get that overbind. Attack appropriately, okay? You have to do it. It's important. Finally, we'll finish it with a, a note about Abzug, right? If I leave well under cover, he's gonna have to let me go. So if I come in, I strike him, and I get away under cover, then he's gotta let me go, right? Um, it's a really important point though, that we can't just get in and hit and stop and stop, but rather that we are going to get in there, we're gonna do our actions, and then we're gonna retreat under cover safely and easily. Thank you, Bubba. Right now being assaulted by a baby. Thank you. Okay, so I get in with Jeff, we strike, bam, uh, I gain my overbind, I threaten, I hit him, and then I want to cover back out however I decide to get out of there. Now, um, with constraints of space right now, I'm backing out. Uh, I could also, as I'm trying to get away and I've got in and I've struck him, press in further, get off to the side, move around him, stab him from the other place, you know, get out of there and then leave undercover. But don't just come in, strike the opponent and stop. All right, guys, so that finishes up the Rostock and its rules for us, but we're not done, okay? This has just been kind of our initial examination of the rules and uh, as they're presented by Meyer. Going forward from here, we get into the fun part where we get to go down that rabbit hole of what these rules mean individually for each of the techniques we're gonna do, when we should do them, how we should do them, why we should do them. So in future videos in this series, that's what we're gonna be looking at. But otherwise guys, hopefully you've enjoyed it. As always, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, criticisms, witty remarks, throw them in the comments and we'll reply to them. But otherwise guys, stay safe. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.